Okay. Well, it's good to uh, be together, and it's even better to get into the Word. That's what we're here for. We need the Word of God, and we are going to be in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, and this morning we'll be looking at verse 9 and 10. Second Corinthians 5, verse 9 and 10. Now, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ of um, being raised from the dead with him and receiving a new body just like his. If you look at verse 1 here in chapter 5, Paul said, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And this truth sustained Paul and has sustained many Christians uh, through the trials and sufferings of this life. Um, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 24 and 25, speaking of the resurrection, Paul said, For we were saved in this hope. What hope? The hope of the resurrection. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. The redemption of our body, a new building from God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, in this life, uh, we, do not, we, we do not see or participate in the fullness or completeness of, of our salvation through Jesus Christ. As we still live in these unredeemed bodies uh, that are subject to temptation, weakness, sickness, uh, disease, and death. And while we're still at home in these bodies, Paul said here in verse 6 that we are absent from the Lord. And we're absent from him in a physical sense. Now, spiritually, we were united to Christ the moment we believed in him. Um, and surrendered our lives to him. But the physical consummation of our union to Jesus Christ is yet to be. As Paul said here in verse 7, he said, We walk by faith, not by sight. Not yet. You know, one day our faith will be sight, but not yet. Not yet. But whatever the case, whether we're still at home in this body, physically absent from the Lord, living by faith, or whether we've left this body in life, and are physically present with the Lord, living by sight. Paul said in verse 9, and that's where we pick things up this morning. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. Now I like the way the um, New American Standard uh, Bible translates this verse. It says, therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. You know, that's our ambition. To please God with our lives. Um, and you know, if I was to put a title to the message this morning, I would title it, The Highest Ambition. The Highest Ambition, to please God. Now, ambition in its natural and self-centered state can be an extremely destructive thing, can it? Um, and it has led many to sacrifice everything, including their marriages, children, other family members and friends, all in the pursuit of selfish goals. Um, the English word ambition comes from the Latin word ambitio, uh, which, means, which comes from a verb that literally means this, to go around. And the Romans used this word to refer to politicians who went around looking for votes to get themselves elected. That's ambition. And it was used to describe people with basically no convictions who sought promotion at any cost, doing anything to achieve selfish ends. And thus, to call someone ambitious was not a positive thing. Um, and generally speaking, ambition rarely is a positive thing unless it comes from a heart that has been sanctified and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Then it can become an extremely positive and even noble thing as it drives an individual to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. The highest ambition. That's the highest and noblest ambition there is, to be pleasing to God in every aspect of life. You know? And 
It's an ambition or aim, as the New King James puts it here, that each of us should have as believers in Jesus Christ. Because as Paul went on to say, if you look at verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That's a sobering reality, sobering verse. We must all appear before his judgment seat someday. And the sobering reality of this, um, that we will receive the things we've done in our bodies in this life, whether good or bad, motivated Paul and should motivate each of us to live lives that are well-pleasing to God, right? That's the only logical conclusion. That's it. That should be our highest ambition, especially in light of the judgment seat of Christ that we must all appear before. Now, the word appear here is an interesting word in the Greek. It, it comes from the Greek word, our English word appear here that, um, that was translated from the Greek word phanero. Uh, it means to make manifest or to make clear, to make visible or to reveal. Um, commentator Philip E. Hughes, he shed some light on the meaning of this word and he said this, to be made manifest means not just to appear, but to be laid bare, stripped of every outward facade of respectability and openly revealed in the full and true reality of one's character. Can you imagine? Yeah. We must all appear, this is what the word means, before the judgment seat of Christ, where every pretense will be stripped away. And the truth about each one of us will be made known and become perfectly clear before the Lord. Now, the Lord already knows it. The real revelation will be to us. Then we'll finally see ourselves in the true light, whether good or bad. And what a day that will be. You know? And, you know, you see this in the scriptures, right? When people had a vision of God or saw God, what do they always say? <laughs> Remember Isaiah? Isaiah saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and he said his train filled, the train of his robe filled the temple and then what was Isaiah's response? Woe is me, I am undone. What happened to Isaiah? He saw God and in seeing God he saw himself. Woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man, he said, of unclean lips. He was humbled. You know? And this day will be a great leveler for all. You know, it was the reality of this too that led Paul to write to the church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth was judging him. They were finding fault with his ministry. And you know, when people are judging you or upset with you, your natural tendency is to defend yourself, right? To start pointing out to yourself all the good things you've done and you know, and you start going in your mind about that. If you meet with them, here's what I'm going to say and everything like that. But Paul Listen to what Paul said about this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. He said this to the church. He said, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know, of no, I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. And then he said this, therefore judge nothing before the time. Until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. Man's judgment is not that important. We make such a big thing of it, right? We worry about what people think about us so much. But the one we should really think about and worry about is what is God's view of me? If we spent more time worrying about that, we'd be a lot happier. I can tell you that right now. And we'd be a lot more secure, <laughs> not so insecure. You know, a lot of the insecurities we have come from just worrying about what people think about us. And, you know, it goes back to our childhood, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, didn't want to get picked, be picked last, you know, for, the, for basketball or whatever sport it was, you know. Wanted to be popular, wanted to be in the in crowd, wanted to be... Liked by everybody. And, you know, we don't really change that much as we get older, do we? We still crave 
the praises of men, as you just sang, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. But we do. We want it. But Paul said here, it's not your judgment or assessment of me. Paul said, not even my own that even matters. What really matters is what the Lord's assessment of me is. When you stand before his judgment seat, when he brings to light the hidden things of darkness, things that we don't even know, not just about other people, but more importantly, about our own selves. And you know what? I want to know now. <laughs> not that I will know then fully, as I'm already known. God already knows everything about me, Paul said. But then, but I want to know more and more now, as much as I can. Why? So I can get as in line with God as I can, so that when I stand before him, it won't be a dreadful thing. But it'll be, yes, I fell short, but oh, now I see. Now I see what you always wanted me to be. Those hidden things of darkness will be brought to light on this great day. And that's why Paul said, don't judge anything until that time. <laughs> because the only one who's qualified to give a true assessment of the work he has done in and through believers' lives is the Lord. Amen. And you know, it's so freeing if I just live my life in the light of his judgment seat. Now, people may not like me. You know, they may disagree with me. And following Christ is never popular in this world. But if I have the Lord's smile on my life, that's really all that matters. And so Paul said, it's not your judgment. It's not even my own that counts so much as the judgment of the Lord. Now, I want to point out here, and this is an important point to make. The believer in Jesus Christ will not be judged for his or her sins at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? And the reason why is because Christ died for their sins already. God has judged our sins on the cross. Paul said in Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so this is not a judgment of condemnation for the sins that believers committed while in their bodies in this world. And we can all praise God for that. Aren't you glad for that? Man, if, God, if, if I was going to stand before the judgment seat and face judgment for my sin, I don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, because I know that I'm done already. But praise the Lord, that is not what this judgment is. What this judgment is that Paul's speaking of here is an assessment of the things that believers did while in their bodies. To see whether they were good or bad, um, to see if they were worthy of commendation and reward or not. Um, now, the word judgment seat here translates bima. Um, and in the Greek culture, bima referred to the elevated platform where victorious athletes received their crowns. And thus, the judgment seat of Christ is the place where Christ will reward believers who faithfully served him and sought to lead lives in this world that were well-pleasing to God. It's the place of reward. Uh, Paul said at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And then he said, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. He said, not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. So it's the place of rewards. Um, and, you know, again, this should really motivate us to serve God and glorify God in these bodies here and now. You know, what we do here and now matters. Yes, our sins are forgiven, but that doesn't mean that we still will not face an accounting before the Lord for the things we've done while in these bodies. And though that accounting will not be judicial in the sense that we will not be judged for our sins, if we've believed in Christ, nevertheless, we can still suffer loss in eternity and lose out on our reward when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ if the things we've done and invested ourselves into in this life had no real merit to them eternally. Did you hear that? You can lose out on your reward. And that's what good or bad here in verse 10 is referring to. When Paul said, 
that at the judgment seat of Christ, we are to receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, Paul was not making a contrast here between what is morally good and morally evil, but rather what is, what is good or bad from the standpoint of our eternal benefit. That's what he's talking about. Our eternal benefit and our eternal reward when we stand before the Lord. And um, we know this because of the word Paul chose here for bad. The word he chose here for bad is not the typical Greek word used to speak of moral evil or sin, but actually it refers to that which is worthless or good for nothing. And that worthlessness and good for nothing, again, is from an eternal standpoint. That's what he's talking about. In other words, it refers to, you could say, the mundane things of life, like leisure, right? Vacationing, hobbies, secular interests, even secular advancement in a career or skill, or the accumulation of more wealth and stuff. Um, now, these things are not in and of themselves inherently evil or wrong, right? But from an eternal standpoint, they have little to no value and pertain mostly to this life and not the life to come in God's eternal kingdom. And so this is what Paul was addressing here when he said that believers are to receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad, at the judgment seat of Christ. Again, he wasn't talking about that which is morally good or bad, as if the believers, uh, as if believers were to face judgment for their sins, but rather he was referring to that which is good or bad, again, from the standpoint of eternity, that which brings eternal gain or eternal loss. And you know... There are so many things that we can give our time and energy and attention to in this life that in and of themselves, of course, are not evil, right? They're not morally wrong. But yet at the same time, they are of no eternal merit or value, and they do not lead to our personal growth in Christ or to the promotion of the gospel in this world. And Paul likened these things in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 to wood hay and straw. You remember that passage? Wood, hay, and straw that will be burned up and consumed at the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> I sure hope there's not a bonfire when I stand there. You know, everything I did, gone. Right? As is the Lord, it's assessed by the Lord. There will, be, there will be some, I'll tell you that. I know that. Even Paul, even Paul the Apostle himself said, I have not attained after 25 years or so of following Christ. He said, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. But things will be evaluated by the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why Paul said we make it our aim. We, it's our highest, it's my highest ambition to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. You know, and I wonder how serious some of us take that. You know, ignoring reality doesn't make it go away. A lot of people choose that tactic. Ah, eh, just ignore it. Right? Hope it doesn't actually ever happen, you know. And many people live their lives that way. You know? Well, death, I know it's going to happen. I'll deal with it when it comes. But, you know, that's not wise. Because the Bible likens our lives to that of building. Building a house, if so to speak. And that's what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 3. He said, there's only one foundation that you can build upon, and that's Jesus, right? There's no other foundation that any, can man, any man can lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And Jesus, you remember, he's, he likened those who heard his words and obeyed them to those who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. But then there were those, he said, who heard his word and did nothing, and they were the ones who built what? On the sand. And when the waves and the wind and the storm came, what happened to their house? It was, it was gone. You know, that's, gonna, that's what's going to happen to so many people. You know? You know? Now, believers, of, thank God our house won't be gone. I mean, it might be gone, but yet Paul said we'll still be saved if we believed in Jesus. Yet so as through fire, meaning everything you did in this world had no eternal merit to it, and thus you'll have no reward 
when you stand before the Lord. And you know, what a tragedy that will be. Do you want to have no reward at all? I don't want to be like that. I don't want to have no reward when I stand before him. And you know, what a heartbreaking moment I think that will be for so many. When they finally realize, as the hidden things of darkness, they're brought to light. The counsels of their hearts were revealed. And they realized, you know what? I love the Lord, but I just didn't really serve him. Now Paul said they'll be saved. You're still going to be in heaven. Jesus died for your sins. You can't be condemned because God already judged your sin at the cross if, if you belong to Christ. But you have no reward. Nothing to show for your life here on earth. What a tragedy that will be for so many. No investment in eternity. You know? Because it's too caught up with the mundane things of life. And you know, here in America, I think we are particularly um, susceptible to this. The American church. Because we have so much. <laughs> We're so prosperous. We're so free. Um, we have so much opportunity to enjoy the things of life, which again, it's not wrong. That's not what Paul's saying here. It's not wrong to enjoy life. In fact, he said to Timothy, God gives us richly all things to enjoy. But Paul then said, command those who are rich to do good and to share <laughs> and to lay up for themselves a good foundation for what? For the time to come. There's a time to come. There's a reckoning. There's an accounting. Remember, Jesus talked about, even in Matthew 25, that he'll divide the sheep from the goats, right? And then those on his right, he'll say, you know, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You know, you helped me. And then they'll say, well, when did we ever do that, Lord? As he said, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The things we do in this life matter. They matter for eternity. You know. And it's not an issue of salvation. Praise God for that. Because we can never do enough to be saved. <laughs> We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Salvation's a free gift, Paul said. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. By grace you are saved. Through what Jesus has done alone. You don't, we don't add to the finished work of Christ on the cross. You know. But what we do in this life still counts. And it counts for eternity. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Now, before we leave this, I just want to also point out the um, individual nature of the judgment. As Paul said, each one. When we stand before the Lord, it's not going to be with other people. Well, I know I didn't do quite as good as I should have, but what about them, Lord? You know? No. It's just you and him. You know? It's just you and him. You and him alone. You know? And you know how important that we understand our own individuality. You know, we, have a, we, we have a tendency to kind of lump ourselves into groups all the time, you know? You know, which is understandable to a point. But when it comes to, between, to me and God, it's just me and God, right? There's nobody else involved in it. That's how close that relationship is. You know? And so each one by themselves will stand before the Lord. And thus, that's why each of us needs to work on our own relationship to God, not be pointing out what's wrong in everybody else's life. You know? Remember Jesus talked about the plank in the eye? You know? When you go around looking for sin in people's lives, he said, you first get that big two by four out of your eye, then you'll see clearly to take that little speck out of your neighbor's eye. We all must appear as individuals and give an account for what we've done, what we've said, what we've engaged in. And everything will be stripped away then, laid bare before God. And so, I guess, in closing, the final the encouragement is this. We still have time. <laughs> to invest but the question is this what are you investing in we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and you know what best to get
prepared now. Because Peter talked about in his letter, we can receive an abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we got to grow. We got to grow in the grace and knowledge of, the Lord, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, add to your faith virtue, <laughs> you know, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, love. He said, if these things are in you, if they abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but an abundant entry will be ministered to you at the everlasting, in his everlasting kingdom. You'll hear those words, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear those words. But if I want to hear those words, I got to build now. And so, May the Lord enable you and me to start building, to prepare ourselves for his judgment seat so that we don't see a big old bonfire. <laughs> but maybe just a little bit, and there's something left. There's a crown for us. And, the Lord, and you know, can you imagine his, him saying, well done? His, condom, his com commend, not condemnation, but commendation. That's the one that counts. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for our time in your word. A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Lord, help us to take these things to heart, Lord. May we not be like that man James talked about who was just a, a hearer of the word and not a doer, Lord. Who saw his natural face in the mirror, but then walked away and for, immediately forgot what kind of a man he was. Oh God, if we need to make changes, help us make them. If we need to repent, help us to repent. If we need to confess any sins this morning, let us do it. Because we must all appear before your judgment seat. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. <clears throat>